All right. Um, good morning. Um, I hope you had a great uh, evening yesterday in Sorrento, Katya, with everyone. Yeah, I, Bef that's fine. Uh, before <laughs> I hand it over to you, I just want to uh, catch up a little thing from the uh, last chapter we did yesterday. Uh, there was the dexterity reference chapter in the uh, in the training. Uh, so, by the way, yesterday in the four hours that we did the training, you worked through 22 chapters, which is uh, impressive, but still, uh, considering there is more than 50 chapters in this training, um, and we skipped over a lot of things, and we skipped all the exercises and all the questions and answers, um, yeah, obviously, a abbreviated version. So, what I want to show you is that is two things. Uh, number one is, uh, I uh, yesterday we talked a lot about um, Volto, uh, Plan 6 having a front end that is decoupled from the back end you, we, via the REST API. And uh, so there, there's one instance running uh, here with the foreground, uh, with the front end, and another instance running with the back end. So the point here is that now, for at least for me, just for this uh, little demo, uh, this is the front end we used yesterday, and this is a completely different back end. So you can use the same front end with a different back end. Uh, when I open that in the browser, I can uh, still go to here, got my Volto site, uh, obviously got my back end site as well, but I got my Volto site, and it doesn't know about talks because the back end that I'm using here doesn't know about talks at all. It knows about something else though, the example content type. It doesn't work in Volto uh, with this checkout that I have here, so I'm not showing that here, but I wanna show you that uh, yesterday I mentioned this uh, example.content type uh, pack package that has all the fields and I just installed it. And since I didn't demo it to you yesterday, I wanted to show you quickly this uh, content type that you can install. And when you edit something, you actually have all these um, field sets with uh, all these various types of fields that are available to you uh, when you develop a content types in Plone, uh, including relation fields with a lot of options, uh, file fields, other fields, including weird things that you probably never need, like the Python identifier field. So no spaces and no dashes there, for example. Uh, date, the data grid field is in there and uh, the default settings. Uh, at some point, maybe I'll get that to run so I quick can quickly show you that later today, uh, the branch for Volto, because the fields look a little different, but it's a, it's a good thing to have that around um, uh, and just look at the screenshots shots alternatively to pick and choose the fields that you want to use to model the data that you need to uh, use in your application or your website. Uh, because keeping all of these in mind in your in your memory is stupid. It's a waste of your uh, mental capacity. So it would be much better to just use that and copy whatever fields you need after checking out the uh, examples here. So without further ado, I'm going to stop my screen sharing and hand it over to Katya, who will do the first chapter this morning. You're still muted, Katya. Hi, all together. Uh, I will continue with the view component. We've seen the content type talk yesterday. And we want to build a view for the instances of this content type. Uh, view in Volto front end is a React component. So we start uh, with a React component. And uh, I head over to the code and um, 
I have to correct myself. I will not start with the red component. I would like to start telling Walter that we will uh, build a view and um, um, the registry is done in the app configuration. This is the file config.js. You can find it in the source folder where all the components are that you write and customizations on the root level, you find the file config.js. Uh, this is the place to for all configurations, like um, if, you're, if you want that your website is multilingual, you can say which uh, languages are provided. And what we do now is that we tell Volto that we have another, an additional view for folderage types. And we start uh, here, the config.js, what you see now is a um, um, plain vanilla configuration. As you see, when you start with a fresh project, it consists of first the import of the default configuration of Volto, and a function it is called apply config. Uh, the name doesn't matter, but what is important to notice is that it's a, a function which takes the default uh, configuration config and uh, it modifies the configuration and then it returns the, the modified configuration. So we hook in here and say we want to override the views value of the default configuration. So we say con config.views would be, uh, we take the default value config.views and say that the Ah, uh, what was it called? I have to look. And the uh, content types views value. This is the one we will override. So once again, the default value config.views. Um, content types views. And now for the content type talk, we say we want the replace. I have to correct myself. We do not register an additional view. We replace uh, the default view. And the default view we will create, uh, we'll get the name talk view. And uh, this, needs to be imported. Import. And we import from our folder components. And our components folder here has uh, we could put a file directly inside this folder, but uh, we will organize ourselves with this view folder and put a file inside here. And for, uh, I switch back to the configuration to import from components folder, we say in the components folder that we have a What uh, talk you from our file that we will create uh, use use talk you and we export it. Export talk view 
So, and now our new file for the view component. So view.jsx. So now we can start with our new view, which is a React component. So we will import first React from React. And then uh, our component uh, export ways to write so i take another one uh, i need a function talk view uh, that takes the inherited props and returns uh, some html and we start with a placeholder a simple diff And we need to export this function. Export default talk talk you. So now we have a simple view component. We have registered it. And when we start now, because we created a new file, we start. And It takes a little bit to build and I already skip over to the front end. And then we should see the placeholder. So I think I made a typo top view. Yeah, okay. Folder is name view. And now when I skip over to the talk, I've already created one. And I see the placeholder. And uh, now we can build up the view step by step. We want to show the title and description and uh, some more information about the single talk. So we can start with, uh, with the title. So I replace the placeholder with Um, and I have available the inherited props where I can find the content or the, uh, or the information about the talk, for example, the title. And when I save, I should see the title. And uh, I would like to write a little bit shorter, so I introduce a little uh, concept. And I pick this content data from the inherited props. So now I can write content.title, content.description, and so on. So I need my description. I start with content description and I wrap it in a paragraph. So diff matter. 
think. And when I save and reload, then you will see that there's an error. And this is because uh, React component expects that the return, the returned value is one node. So we wrap it in a, a div or um, if we do not want to uh, write a div, we can use the red fragment, which um, you will not see rendered, but uh, sorry, this should, which is not uh, a fragment or an empty tag, which is not rendered, but uh, uh, fulfills the requirement that the return statement should return only a single, a single uh, node. So then we can see our title and our description. And I head over to some uh, nice uh, display. Um, we have seen yesterday uh, the semantic UI fragment, which um, provide uh, some helper components um we do not want to write again and again so for example um here we are the text sticks to the left border of our page and uh, the the container component from semantic ui helps us with the margins and headings and so on so we import our uh, container component import Container from semantic UI React. Re uh, semantic UI React is the React package that provides these uh, components. And now we can use this container here. Container. And we should see. One bracket too much. See what it says. Yeah, better. So we have uh, our container that um, lines up our content, and we can continue to fill the view with more uh, data. Uh, for example, we want the description or the the formatted. Um, larger description and we, we add another paragraph or diff with content and the field is called details and the details field is a, um, a rich text field the rich text field and we uh, we fetch our data from the back end and the communication is done via rest api and so we, we get our content uh, formatted in uh, JSON and uh, the, the information about the de details field uh, looks is not a text value, but it's an uh, object with, where do I have that?
Ah, here. Uh, the, the value of the details field comes to the front end as an object of the data we're interested in. This is what we will dis display. And uh, the information about the encoding and the content type. So what we need here is not only content details, but content details data. And as this is uh, HTML, we want to protect our app. And we take this code snippet. This will um, check the data and helps us to protect our app. And then we can see the data. This looks okay. And the next step would be uh, we want uh, we have different types of talks, so we want to display this and all the, also the audience and uh, speaker info, because we have in this talk scene that we have can make an entry for the, the speaker, this company, etc. And these values we want to uh, show also same the speaker image. So we head over to. Mm. Um, yeah. The code again, we have our container um, with margin and padding, and we want to add another um, isolated part for the speaker info before we uh, add the talk info itself, like uh, type of talk and um, audience. So uh, here I use again a helper component from Semantic UI. It's called Segment. It will help me with um, border and um, some more layout. So I create a segment. And yeah, so there are, I will place the speaker info and so on. And I'm a little bit lazy, so I copy this code from the documentation. So as I said, we use the semantic UI component segment, so we will uh, have to import it. And then we can use it here. You see the attribute clearing that uh, is on the way where you um, can use variations of these semantic UI components. And here's once again a little arrow. Segment clearing. So I have in this segment the speaker information. First, I check if the speaker information is there. If yes, I uh, display our uh, header in this segment. And this is also a semantic UI component, so I import this. And then I can use it. Dividing means that it's uh, formatted with a bottom border. Then I need the company info or the website info alternatively. And I want to uh, show the, <clears throat> the email. And obviously here I have no closing tag. I check for the email and then I need it here. This should be indented. And afterwards, I close this. Then it's a lot better. And all 
also I check for the existence of the speaker bi biography. And uh, once again, as it is uh, a rich text field, I take the data part and I protect with uh, this code snippet. And when I save and see, then I have this segment here, bordered, and the header with the um, bottom border and some information about the company and the speaker biography. And this is my speaker biography data. And so we are quite far with our talk view. What's uh, left is the type of talk and the uh, audience um, as we are a little bit late in the schedule i only want to add the um, the type of talk so i skip over to the documentation i have the yeah, type of talk i add it to the header here okay. No, yeah. you have the uh, title of the talk and I will add something curly brackets because I use JavaScript code. So I need the content type of talk. And uh, type of talk is a value that comes from a um, choice field. So a type of talk is not a text value but an object with a token and title values and i'm interested in the title and here it recommends to break the line so now i have the lightning talk type rendered and i give um at a space so i see in the title the type of talk and i if you see in the documentation you can add some more information uh, for example audience maybe we can add this also i have to skip a little bit uh, i take the code here and We will see what we add. We uh, we take the audience. Uh, it is in, um, it is interesting um, because this is um, you can see how to deal with arrays of values. Uh, audience itself is um, a list or an, an array of values, and we we check again uh, for ex uh, for the existence of this value. We have done it here with um, a Boolean end. Uh, what we do here is, um, uh, how's the name of this operator? Um, the, the sense to, to write it like this is that um, it means we take the content and if the audience uh, key exists, we can work with this and then we have an array value and we can iterate over the items. So we take again the map function, which takes one item of the array. And uh, it's a function that uh, returns uh, some HTML enhanced um, by React. So we uh, here, once again, we use a helper component from uh, semantic UI, uh, it's called label, and you will soon see how it will be rendered. Um, what we take is uh, the item title, that's not what I want. Uh, no. um, the function uh, takes uh, one uh, element of the array. The array is uh, our audience list what the um, uh, editor uh, has chosen. So we take one item and uh, this is also um, um, not a text value, but um, an array of objects with token and title. So we take 
from this array item the title. This is on this line. And we want the label to be colored. So we have the attribute color and we make a little um, color mapping. Uh, so the color is cal calculated. Um, it takes the item token. So beginner, uh, professional, advanced, I don't know what we took there as um, valid values. And um, we use a color mapping. Uh, it's a simple mapping function here. I copy this code because it's really... Um, I place it just before the return inside our red component. And this is just a, a, not a mapping function, but an object. So we can use this mapping here, color. We take the token and it gives us back the color and we use this color in the label. And the label, the semantic UI component then is hopefully rendered according the chosen value. And as you see here, uh, it's just what we wanted. We selected in this uh, talk. Here we have the field audience. We selected two values. Um, and when we save, we have these uh, labels. So, yeah. What you've seen now is how you can customize the view of a content type. You write a view component, which uh, re returns some HTML enhanced by React. Uh, you can use uh, semantic UI helper components. We uh, use container, header, label, segment. These are components very often used. And um, you registered your view in the overall app component uh, configuration uh, where we import the view component and we um, skip into the uh, configuration function. We take uh, the default value, here also the default value, and we say for the content type talk. Uh, we want Walter to apply the talk view component. So this would be my part for now. Uh, any questions so far? Do you want to continue with the behaviors? Yep. So since uh, we don't see any questions, we'll just continue. Um, okay. Um, by the way, I got the other thing running in Volta as well, but uh, I'll show you later if we have enough time for that. So um, the last chapter that Katya did was uh, in the front end folder so you remember we have this training chapter uh folder and there is a back end and a front end folder uh i have two editors um one for the front end and another one for the back end i hope where is it uh, here is my back end folder yeah so it says front end it says back end so the root folder actually displays in the head um in the window heading which is super helpful um, especially since they are the same editor. Uh, now we're moving back to the uh, backend folder. So I got uh, again, oh, let me move that out of the way. So I got my two instances running. This is the backend instance, this is the front end uh, process. Um, and um, we want to add some functionality. Uh, 
uh, to the content type that we already created. So the, we have this uh, talk content type and it has nice views now. Uh, so in my schedule, I have, I should have one. I hope still have the, and I'm not logged in properly because I switched my backends. If you switch backends, you always need to re-log in because the um, the cookie doesn't uh, is not is not valid. So my content type looks like this. Um, but yeah, you just saw that how you how we created that. So now we want to add a new feature. And I in the very beginning when I talked about what Plone actually is, I mentioned um, a fact uh, that Plone content types are um, combined out of uh, are schema based and uh, made out of schemata. So schemata is plural for schema. And when you wrote the content type um, for uh, that we're using here, so the talk content type, this is only one schema. And you might have realized uh, when editing uh, your content type, um, you have these fields like title and summary and change note and here categorization, language, ownership that, that you didn't write at all. So where do they come from? They came from other schema and another schema or a multitude of schema ta in this case that are also used in this content type. And when you registered uh, the FTI in the uh, in generic setup here, the talk XML file, you might remember that I said, okay, here's the class. So that's the instantiated object in the database. Uh, here's the schema. This is your uh, this is your schema, and these are all other schemas, and these are referenced by uh, as named utilities. Uh, so they this is not a Python path, but it's, it has a name. So they somewhere in Plone there are things registered with the name Plone Dublin Core, Plone Name from Title, and Plone Versioning. And everything else comes from them, uh, all the other features. And let's, it's, it's often important to figure out where they come from, what they are, what the name is, uh, what, what they contain. So you can uh, basically steal uh, and, and, and learn from these examples. So everything I, I said yesterday, I said that most things in Plone are registered in ZZML. The same is true for uh, these behaviors. So I'm going to search for Plone Dublin Core uh, in ZZML files and see if I find something. Actually, there is something. Yes. So it is in Plone App Dexterity Behaviors Configure ZZML. There is a behavior defined that's named Plone Dublin Core. And it points to a uh, here to a interface that actually has that. So let's uh, let's check out what what's in there. Um, so metadata. This is a relative Python path. So here it starts at dot metadata Dublin Core relative Python path uh, Dublin Core in where was it in metadata? Let's look for i Dublin Core. Here it is. There's nothing in there, but it inherits from other behaviors. So you, you have one behavior that's actually a combination of four behaviors altogether. So ownership, publication, categorization, and iBasic. Let's go to iBasic. Um, let's see where that is. It's here. And that has the title and the description. And voila, we found uh, the solution to the riddle where the title and the summary actually came from. And the same is true for all the other fields that you're not seeing here. So yeah, nice brain melting example, but what's the use for that? So why are we doing that? Um, the reason is very simple. We are lazy and we don't like to repeat ourselves. Um, so, because if we repeat ourselves, we have to write multiple tests, we have to maintain uh, multiple instances of same or similar code. So, uh, Plone has this concept 
of behaviors that can be enabled for different content types and shared uh, have a shared code base. Um, so the title and the summary and a lot of other things, uh, the, the versioning is not like, okay, I have a content type, now I need to write versioning for that. So I reinvent versioning every time I write a new content type. That makes very little sense. It is a abstract concept that can uh, should be uh, dealt with uh, once and can be applied to all kinds of content types with all kinds of fields. That initially makes it harder, for example, for versioning, uh, to write that in the first place, because if you only have a title and a text field, versioning is much easier than, for example, if you also have binary data or more complex data types that you need to version. Um, but uh, the benefits are obviously there because you can then reuse your code. And our stupid example in the next chapter is that we want to uh, add a new field. Uh, you remember when we in uh, yesterday uh, modified the news item, the default news item to have this hot news field, a Boolean checkbox. Uh, this is something that we something that we now want to implement as a behavior because we realized that we can uh, we want to uh, highlight uh, certain talks, for example, very important ones or keynotes or the party or news items uh, where the registration is closing or hey, we really need two more talks on the front page. And to do so, we want this checkbox. Okay, show this on the, um, on the uh, checkbox saying, what should it say, featured. Uh, show this item on the front page is what we uh, want this checkbox to show. And this will allow us to have at some point a list of items that are selected with this checkbox here on the front page without additional uh, or manually adding them to the front page each time we think something is really important. Uh, that's a very sane data structure. So we could go to our talk and try to modify the schema uh, in, in the user interface. And yesterday we had a short, uh, someone asked the question if XML is better than Python. And actually in, in one, and it's a very, very important way, XML is much, much better than Python because a XML schema is editable through the web and a Python schema is not. So when I go to dexterity content types, my news item, I can add, um, hang on. Um, my news item and I go to the schema, always forgot to, how to click there. I can actually add a new field, but for the uh, talk content type, because that is a Python schema that is or should not be possible. I'm not sure, I'm pretty sure this will not work whenever, if I, if I press save here, this is uh, maybe a bug index in, in Volto because in, in classic clone that this doesn't work. Uh, the reason is that, uh, as I said yesterday, schemata are serialized as XML and stored in the database, basically as text. And then a magic class is instantiated when you create your content type through the web. But in this, this case, we have a content type in Python and the schema is in Python. So there is no magic in the database that holds XML for the schema. There is no XML schema for that. You, you can't have this as an XML schema unless you write it yourself. Um, so we can not just add this additional field, but um, what I didn't show yesterday is this, this uh, tab here is the selection of all the behaviors that are enabled on, a, on one content type. And here we actually see the three behaviors that are selected, one's Dublin core, uh, the other was name from title, which makes sure uh, uh, that the URL is auto-generated from the title that you put in. It's actually smart enough to take care of the language. So if you say München, for example, and your website is in German, it says München because a U umlaut is in, in, in German uh, transliteration, let's say it is UE. 
But if your website is English and you type München, it would be München because that is, that's just the rule of different languages, how to deal with special characters. So Plone is pretty smart in that uh, regard. And the fourth version um, um, behavior is versioning and that's also enabled. You could, could also disable that. And this way you can, um, the, that's the point, whole point of it, enable features uh, make additional fields available. You can also split up the Dublin core metadata behavior and just use uh, the basic metadata, which is title and description. But uh, we'll leave that as it is for now and add a behavior. So, and again, we wanna do that the proper way. And also we didn't use XML, so we can't um, do, do that um, by hand. So we'll write that in code. And to write that in code, um, we need to, um, yeah, write some Python. Um, a behavior, as I said, is a, let's say a thing, a thing that is registered in Plone. And uh, in this case, uh, Plone needs to know about that on startup. On startup, Plone leads, uh, reads uh, Python files and the XML files. Uh, not XML, sorry, ZZML files. And um, as a best practice, you organize your behaviors in a separate module or folder called behaviors. Uh, obviously you can call that whatever you want, but it's these best practices are there for the reason that why do we have, oh, I already have that folder. It's just empty. And um, these best practices are there for the reason that when you, I don't know, lightning strikes you and you, or you drop dead from too much good wine, uh, the developer who comes after you, he is then uh, able to, uh, to pick up where you left off. And since you use sane defaults, he obviously instantly knows, yeah, your behaviors are in the folder of behaviors, which is a Python module. To be a Python module, a folder needs, again, a empty init py file. Actually, I'm not 100% sure if that's still true in Python 3. I think that may only be required for Python 2, but I may be, I may be uh, wrong there. And um, we also need a configure ZZML file here. Uh, we'll add that uh, in the same folder. Um, just do it like this and we'll paste the content of this thing in here. And then we need to tell our add-on that this module is actually also holds ZOOP components. So we need to tell uh, the main configure ZZML of the PlonConf site package. Again, uh, we are in, oh, let's go there, backend, SRC, PlonConf.site, SRC, PlonConf, site. So yeah, it's annoying, but it's just what it is. Uh, deal with it. Um, okay, add behaviors here. So at startup, plone, uh, the ZOOP component architecture reads this configures that GML since uh, the package uh, says plone to do so. Actually, it says so here. There is a snippet in the uh, here, the Z3C auto include plugin that makes sure that the ZZML files actually are read or it's checked if there are any. Uh, and then this file is read and this makes sure that this file is also read. And here we have our behavior it's, it's, uh, that is uh, registered here. So it has a title called featured, has a name, as I said, these have the nice short names and they point to a path. Again, this is a relative Python path and I hate relative Python paths. I want a absolute Python path. And to do that, I need to do plone conf.site.behaviors.featured.ifeatured. -featured. Oops, and if I make a typo, that is even worse. It is exactly the same. Um, and it's a matter of choice. I prefer absolute paths. You can keep re relative path. Uh, they are exactly the same. It's just um, to get you a basic idea that 
this is a Python path. And uh, when you use other uh, Python, when you write a method or a class in Python, you can say from plonconf site behaviors featured, import I featured. And then you have this interface uh, imported, uh, which doesn't exist yet. So featured is a Python module that doesn't exist yet. We could fake that in init.py, well, we're not gonna do that. We'll just really create a file that you can instantly see. And then we copy and paste this thingy in here. And this should look very familiar to you. Um, it might have been a lot yesterday uh, with the content type talk, and you might not remember all these fields, but you should remember that the schema is a class, in, a interface class that inherits from model schema. That is, that is something you, you can certainly memorize. And here we have the exact same case. So our interface, our schema is an interface inheriting from model schema. There are two differences though. The talk content type has at the very bottom uh, has the class, uh, the content type class, the instance class. We're not gonna use that for a behavior because um, the talk, even though it will have the behavior feature, will still be a talk. So we, we don't need a, uh, a, a instance class. Um, and also we have this, uh, we also provide the iForm field provider interface uh, in for our schema, which makes sure that when we render uh, the edit view of any content that has this uh, behavior enabled, that this is actually rendered as a editable field. If we remove that, uh, we still have the, the featured behavior. Um, we can still, still uh, store data, but we're not going to get any user interface from that, which would be stupid. So we really want a user interface with that. So that's what we want. Um, and that's basically it. We don't need anything else. If I restart my instance, I don't have to reinstall my package. I just restart my backend instance. After a while. then I should be able um, to see um, when I go to my talk content type, so waiting for the backend, now it's there. Uh, there should be a new behavior on the block uh, called featured and here it is. So that's what you did. And when I uh, check this box featured now and save, if I don't do save, let's do that first. And I just, um, yeah, edit my content type. There's, this field doesn't show up obviously because it's not enabled this behavior. And um, once I click this box and save and I go to uh, my schedule and I edit my content type, then I have this new field show this item on the front page. And in uh, this case, we can reuse this feature for multiple uh, content types and uh, so sharing the uh, functionality over uh, various content types. That is a good idea in this case. Um, so yeah, what's interesting? Yeah, so I said the, I showed you the, um, the talk content type when we registered that the FTI factory type information. I also register edit the default behaviors that come with normal content types. So these are exactly the same that you also see uh, on a document, for example, on a, on a page or on a news item. A news item has some more actually, and even text has some more. Uh, uh, pages have some more, but these are these are very frequently used, and but um, and so upon installation of the package, uh, talk content types get these behaviors enabled. And we want the same. So our behavior that we registered by name, clone con featured, should be 
enabled by default whenever we um, create a site, install this package. So this is how we do that. So the, the whole idea of this training is to create a package that you can reuse in the year 2525. Um, every year there is a new conference, but you're gonna create new, um, new uh, websites and you're not gonna reuse the same database. So when you install this add-on, this feature should already uh, automatically be enabled. And this is to, how to make uh, sure of that. At that point, you again, you make a commit and um, yeah, you're done. So it shows up and you can use that. So, uh, okay, that was, uh, are there questions about this? Because um, that's good. So I'm, I'm checking this box for the dexterity for the wind talk. And um, again, uh, again, I'll show you that we're not cheating in any way. And I go down the Python rabbit hole and see uh, what's the field name again? Where's my editor? Here's my editor. Uh, the field name was featured. So I can ask this Python object, are you featured? And it says, yes, I'm featured. So yeah, it's actually there. It's in the database. It's there as an attribute on the object, but it is not there in the index when I'm searching for it. So when it's not there in any index when I'm searching for it, I can't use it in this collection um, block. So when I click here, you remember uh, these, the, um, what's it called? Uh, the listing block, sorry. Uh, the listing block allows you to add criteria. And in this case, we have one criteria which is type. So we, uh, uh, we show all news items. Now let's uh, in show all news items and all talks. And now we would want to show all news items and talks that are featured because everything else should not be featured. But there is no criteria for featured here. But plone wouldn't be plone if that were impossible. We have to do a couple of things to do that. Uh, to make that available. So number one is we need to tell the plone built-in catalog. I showed that quickly, to, shortly to you, um, how to uh, to actually index the data that is in some of in in this field. Uh, to do so, we use a XML file. Let me close this annoying editor that I have open here, and maybe that as well because I don't need that. Uh, so. Um, in generic setup yesterday, we added uh, here, we told the portal type tool about the new talk. Now we'll talk, uh, tell the portal catalog, which is also a tool. Um, it's called catalog XML about a new index. Um, and I'll just copy and paste the XML, oops, in here and tell it to, where is it? Here is it. To there's a new index in town, it's called featured. It indexes the, attri the, the attribute featured of any content type, and it's a Boolean, Boolean index. There are a couple of different indexes. Uh, there are field indexes, which are used most frequently, for example, for text fields. Um, there are keyword indexes that allow you to have um, multiple yeah, a keyword style lookups. That's what it says uh, for for um, when you have uh, when you tag content. A keyword index is best. Then there are date indexes and stuff like that. And there's a crazy uh, crazy uh, top copy. No, I'm not top copy. Some some rich text index, um, searchable text index. You usually don't want to write your own for that. So this is a very simple index. It just stores true or false. And um, so this new index uh, will be created when, do I need to start up my site? Do I need to reload the browser or do I need to reinstall my package? The last one is true because I modified a XML file. Every time I modify an XML file and I want that 
uh, that change to be uh, active, I need to reinstall my add-on. I could do, again, I told uh, many times yesterday that uh, Plone um, has all these backend features available where you can go to uh, Plone and say, hey, there is the catalog and here are the indexes and I'm going to create a new Boolean index and a new whatever index. Here's the uh, Z3 text index and stuff like that. But we're not going to do that. We're going to do that in, um, in, in our code and I'll just reinstall our add-on. It will still not break anything. Uh, going to add-ons, PloneConf site uninstall and it should be down here now plum side install and uh, again here it should say is doing stuff catalog imported so let's make sure that it's true let's go to the uh, zmi indexes is there a catalog uh, index called featured yes it has um, two values and but nothing is indexed yet because the item was not modified. I could re index it here manually, check, uh, check this box, re index it. Um, it's actually good for developers to know that if you can inspect them, browse the results, and see everything that is true, there's only one thing uh, that has this uh, feature. So these are, uh, it's a very powerful backend. And even though you do all the development in the front end, and Volto is really nice to work with. Uh, these tools, these tools, you really need them uh, when you do backend development. So yeah, uh, we did this. So we now we could search for that, but that doesn't help because uh, not enough at least uh, because we need um, uh, here this. Uh, the listing block, um, this still doesn't show up. Um, let's see, where are my, uh, hang on, add criteria. So there is still no featured here. It doesn't, it just doesn't show up. Um, to, it's just the case. Uh, we need to do something else. We need to register. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's a bit annoying, but we need to register that. Where is it? Oh, it's in the next chapter. Okay. Do you want to continue with the next? I, I'll just do the beginning and you'll do the... Uh... No, no, please. It's, uh, it fits well to your okay. uh, talk. So yeah, that's um, the, the reason why <laughs> that, yeah, that's a good point. The reason why this is split in two parts, in two chapters, even though it's, it, it fits very well in, would fit very well in one, is that when you do that in the back, uh, in Plone Classic, you, the approach is a bit different. And so you need different, uh, there are two chapters in Plone Classic for that. Um, yeah, never mind. So here we need to register. Um, so this doesn't show up yet, and we will register uh, that as a query string. Yeah. Okay. It's just it's just the way it is. It is called query string XML. Is that okay? Yeah. In default registry query string XM. That is right. Yeah, so the uh, we haven't talked about the registry yet. We'll talk about that later. In this uh, in this case, just uh, make sure that in your default profile there is a folder called registry. It has a main XML that has nothing in it, but you can add additional files. And in this case, we'll add a query string XML. And it's just a another good practice since the registry is huge. It stores all kinds of settings for Plone to uh, be able, you don't have to, but you're able to separate these settings into different files. You could also call them, I don't know, uh, chocolate sauce.xml. Uh, the point is all these files will be read and it is your job to get, make the code that you are creating for posterity uh, as readable as possible. And when you have a file called query string XML, what does the developer who comes after you and has to clean up your stuff, 
uh, expect he expects registration of query strings obviously so let's paste that here and it registers a field type query string with the name featured as a uh, iQuery field. Um, this is just something I can never memorize and I always have to look up in the training and copy and paste this or other examples uh, from, from this training or uh, other places in Plone code. So again, this is XML. Uh, we need to reinstall our package. And then uh, this is, here's more explanation and more links to all kinds of query string declarations and what you can all do with that. And if you really, if you need this kind of feature, uh, please look it up here, it's all linked here. So now we will um, uh, again, reinstall the package. I didn't even, I don't even have to restart. It's not Python code, it is just XML uh, and it just needs to be read so now it didn't say anything, but it hopefully read that. And now when I edit my listing block again, let's, uh, oopsie, let's do that again. Uh, so the listing block, I, sorry, I'm clicking too fast for my browser. Edit, breathe, slow click select good add criteria featured there it is voila um excellent uh, so that seems to be working um select featured and the value is can be no so display everything that has no that has false uh, so why does not nothing have false because nothing else has this, uh, only our content type has this behavior. So false is not now a none uh, or attribute error for, uh, if, if that attribute wouldn't exist. So this, uh, this is why uh, false uh, doesn't show anything here. And now I can save and I can have, I can save and caching, yes. Caching again uh, tells me uh, we don't have an image for that. So let's pick a different uh, view for the listing. Oh, actually we, we uh, since I checked out the code for this chapter, I have the code for all the previous chapters. And in one of the previous chapters, you remember we, uh, we uh, modified uh, the uh, the news item, the summary view where we found the bug in Balto, and the um, and the listing block, and the listing block now has this date. So dexterity for win the win has this uh, behavior now. We'll quickly um, enable this behavior for news items as well. Uh, I'll do that in uh, manually uh, this time. So we have this, uh, we added this, this field yesterday. Uh, I'll ignore that and just use our featured behavior, save and take one of the news items, uh, submit your talks, for example, and say, this is also very newsworthy for the front page and hot news can now die a slow death. And now two items show up here. Um, so yeah, excellent. That works. Um, to summarize <coughs> this chapter, um, it is um, we didn't we didn't write a lot of code. We registered one boolean field, and then we we registered new indexes, but we didn't program an index. You didn't program a catalog. You didn't program a query string. You just switched certain you, you added registrations to switch on certain features that are they were just sitting there and waiting for you to actually do so to switch on to be switched on so plone is full of these uh, hooks that you can use um, to um, to extend existing features and make them do what you want them to uh, because it's it's not we're not 
uh, breaking or magically extending Plone. We're just using the features in exactly the same way that they're meant to be. So the, the query string thing and the whole index thing that was programmed to be extended. It's not, oh, by the way, you could patch that. It's not a patch, not at all. This is the default behavior of the catalog is to be uh, to be um, to be a container for arbitrary indexes. Uh, actually, even our arbitrary new index types that you can add and register. So it's it's so pluggable. It is a total mess uh, for your brain. Um, the listing block, um, that is something we will probably uh, do in one of the next iterations of the trainings to not use the uh, the listing block and add this uh, the stuff that we uh, like we did now, uh, but instead, uh, no, let's, let's skip this part. Let's skip this part. Um, let's go, yeah, this is the chapter that will at some point probably go away. And unless you have any questions, I will uh, hand it over to Katya. Uh, that is one of yours, isn't that true? Um, can we think about when we will make a break before I start with my chapter? That's a very good point. Let's do a break right now, or should we power through this chapter? We spent uh, one hour and 15. How long do we think this chapter will take us? Probably 20 minutes at least, maybe more. Um, I don't know if, do you, does anyone have strong opinions if you wanna keep going or should we do a, a short break now? I think I need uh, 25 minutes, 30 minutes, something like this. So we will be at... That's al almost five o'clock. So let's do a break now. So everybody has a, a, some, some air in their brains. Uh, let's do a short one. Like uh, let's meet at 23 past four, which is a stupid time, but that's what it is. It's eight minutes for you. Um, and yeah, talk to you soon. Uh, write something in the chat if you have questions. I saw the, uh, the, tr the deployment training yesterday. They had so many questions in the chat. Uh, you should be ashamed of yourselves for not asking any questions in Slack. So we're kind of back. Katya is still missing. Um, there she is. Excellent. By the way, thanks for uh, um, sacrificing your Sunday for us. Uh, so we really appreciate that, every one of you guys and girls. So can I continue? Everyone there? So I, uh, what we want to do now is to display a list of talks with information about the type of talk, audience, uh, maybe speaker info and so on. So uh, what we could do is that we, we add a listing block to a page. So for example, on the front page, we could add a listing block and say- You still need to share your screen. Oh, oops. Desktop one, share, okay. So what we could do is to add the listing block, for example, on the front page, um, listing block and criteria. Okay. 
uh, type talk, talk and uh, we want only the published ones. So we select the criterion review state published. And when I save, I see nothing. Why do I see nothing? Because my only talk that I have is private, so I change to public. Okay, and then let's get back. Then I see a, a list of talks, in this case, only one talk. And um, but we do not want only to see the title, uh, the date when the talk happens and the description, but we want some more. We want the type of talk, etc. So um, this is one uh, template for listing block or called variation. We have some more variations as we already have seen. This is the default one that we extended by the date. Image gallery summary is also um, possible uh, variation of a listing talk. And if we want to show more data or in a different way, maybe themed also, then we could write in our front end package uh, another variation of a listing block. But we will take another way to achieve a listing. Uh, what we will do now is uh, we create another view but uh, it's not about only creating a new view. Uh, what is also important in this chapter is that you see how you can fetch data from the backend because the talk view itself from the former chapter that uh, what is displayed here is data from the um, from the content instance itself we are sitting on. We are on the uh, con uh, instance of the content type talk and we are on the instance uh, in use in Python 3.10. And you, when you open the developer tools, uh, you can see that I do have my talk view, talk view, you can see that you have in the props, the part content, where you have uh, the nearly complete information about this content type instance. And this you can directly display in a view of this content type. And what we do now is that we create a view where we, uh, need some more information, not only this uh, content information about this instance, we are creating the view for. So we want to fetch data from the backend. In this case, uh, uh, the published talks or the talks with uh, audience type beginner or something like this. So we will define our uh, search query and we will use the um, a default action from Walto. And let's see how we can do this. First, we create a view uh, and register it. So I take this part for the configuration. And I add it here. And what this means is that um, before we had the in content types view, we said for the content type talk, we want the view talk view. And what we modify here in the default configuration is the part layered views. That means that if there's a folderish content type, it has already some default views like listing, summary, uh, full content view, tabular view, etc. And we want uh, an additional view and we call it talk list view. And we will write the um, corresponding red component uh, 
uh, talk test view. So we will create this file. Um, before we create it, we import it and then we skip to our components folder, views folder. We have our talk view here and we add another file for our new view, talk view for JSX. And then I take a um, simple placeholder view. I don't know, I have my code here. And um, when I start now the front end, uh, the, the view is not already available because the backend also needs to needs this information that there's an additional view for the for the rich type so or for a special content type so i head over to the back end where's my back end here and i escape to the my instance blown and i go to portal types and I say that I want for the content type page, another view. And um, I already put it here, available view methods. And so we are prepared to use this view. So when I uh, start here, uh, okay. okay, here I need also my new view. My top is you, so I have the the talk, 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 oh no, talk, this view. And uh, I, and I uh, make an import and an export in the index file of the component folder so that I can write in config.js, I import from dot components. So I have my additional view, top list view. I made the entry and the backend in available views. And now I restart because I renamed the file. <clears throat> so I go to schedule, which is a page. Um, is it a page? No, it's not a page. Mm. Ah, I missed the menu for uh, the selection of the view. So here now I have, uh, I should create a new page to see. Uh, If I save this, then I see that the um, 
the document view, the default view that is selected, and I added an additional view, talk list, I can select it. And then I see my placeholder here. And now comes the interesting part where we want to fetch a list of talks from the backend. And this is done by using an action. And um, the point here is that we do not fetch the data uh, into our view, in our view component in this uh, where are we? talk list view here. Um, but the, the action is a Redux action. That means the, the action, uh, we dispatch the action and the action does the fetching for us. And it uh, fetches the data and stores it in the global app store. And the, the component itself um, has access to the data from the global app store via a subscription. So we have both the action, the, the default action from Volto that we dispatch and the subscription uh, to get the access. These plays are very well together. And we will see how we do this. Um, I take first the dispatching. Mm. Yeah. We we'll copy the whole code and we we'll step through it. What I have here is I dispatch the action. Uh, my action uh, is named search content. And um, yeah, what I do is um, I use the React hook use effect. Um, in my opinion, it doesn't make sense to, to go into details how this uh, works. For me, it's important that that you realize what that the data, as I said, is fetched by the action and the data stored in the store. And the subscription you can see here in these three lines where um, we define a, a constant um, that we uh, um, later on uh, use to to skip over the list and display each item with additional data and so on. And uh, we, um, we subscribe via the Redux use selector hook and we point to the store. Unfortunately, it's called um, by, con how do you say it in English? It's a convention that uh, the store is named state. So we have a function in state that points to the part search, sub request, conference talks. And why do we name it conference talks? We uh, tell the action to use this um, part of the store to fill with the fetch data. So we have our action search content. And uh, this is. Um, the identifier for our subscription and the search options itself. Uh, we define here and we say also, please fetch data from all over the site. So we, we say here, uh, take the path route. So our search options are portal type talk because we want only talks. Maybe we could also add in a search option, um, review state published and full objects true means um, that we do not only want the, the minimum of data uh, that would be a title, uh, the identifier, the address, uh, review state, portal type, and so on. But um, we all so want the type of talk, etc. audience. So we take these uh, search options. So we have both together. We say, please action, fetch the data 
and we have our subscription here and we have access via this constant talks and now we can go to the rendering part um we have a title description and then here we can use the array of talks we uh, check for the existence if we have uh, talks array defined then we skip over the items uh, with the map action and we take the item itself and we display um, title and description for the beginning and then we are nearly done let's see how it renders uh, i see nothing because Top list view. Let's see our configuration. Top list view. Okay. Mm -hmm. Talks. Uh, I don't see any error. See the console now. It's okay. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, that looks definitely better. So we have your list of one uh, talk. And the next step would be uh, to add information about type of talk. And we can reuse code from our talk view. So I skip down. We have once again our color mapping for the label of the audiences. That would be this part. And we add the type of talk and we will add the speaker image and the description so i take this code paste it. so we have here now we have uh, we iterate over the talks and we have a segment uh, this is once again a semantic UI helper component. We use the link component, not from semantic UI, but from Volto itself. And uh, we take the type of talk. We map over the audiences that are selected for the um, single talk. Uh, we use the color mapping. Again, we have seen in the talk view and um, the default green and we display if it's available the speaker image chat a red curly line okay let's see A red curly line. This is uh, not an error, but a warning. I need a comma here. And then it's fine. Okay. Let's see if we have any warnings here. No. Looks good. Um, 
I think I've forgotten in the talk view chapter the, um, the flatten to app URL. Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, um, just to be sure that we talked about it. Um, if you you use the, um, the semantic UI component image here with um, some theming information floated and alternative text and the size. And um, the, the important thing is the, the address of the image. You can uh, get this uh, address from item image uh, where you have different scales and we want the scale preview and we want um, the address itself by download. And then um, we convert this uh, address because what we get here item this is coming from the uh, the fetch data uh, from the backend and the backend delivers uh, addresses with port 88 in this case and we want to convert it uh, to the to an address that fits into the volta front end which uh, is running in our case on uh, localhost port 3000 and this flattened to app or, uh, um, method, uh, which is a helper method from Volto. Here we import this method from Plone Volto helpers that uh, does this conversion for us. So if the image component from semantic UI is rendered, the source uh, attribute value will be something like localhost 3000. And um, yeah, so with this helper, we are fine. And now we, we see the image, we see the labels. And um, this is what I try to achieve. We could enhance it with a little bit more info, but I think the important part is that it's clear how this um, fetching of the data works and how the, um, the role of the app store and um, maybe a short outlook that um, um, you get very far with this default actions that Walter provides. Um, but your it's um, it, if you write another add-on, um, it could be it, it will be sure will be that you need a uh, um, custom action when you write an action and the corresponding reducers to to imitate this um, um, way to go to. Um, say what has to be fetched and make it config configurable like uh, the search action where um, a path can be provided uh, for the dispatching of the action and uh, action uh, options. And uh, you, you define a custom action and the corresponding reducer which does the job that it um, uh, stores the fetch data in the store. And then you can, like here, subscribe uh, to the mentioned part in the store and you're fine and can use this uh, custom action, which points to a an, uh, REST API endpoint uh, on the backend side. So any questions so far? Let's see our chat. Um, if you want, you can also break um, per voice, I think. Okay, Philip. Yes, I'm here. Oh. 
Okay. Um, next up, um, we're not going to do any development. Uh, I was looking at the uh, yesterday. We also we used the uh, the React Developer Toolbar, and again um, here I just inspected the talk list view and looked at content and here then at some point i have these the items I'm not sure why i yeah, I have a, that's empty list. yeah whatever uh, so we'll still have to figure out what's wrong with the uh, listing um uh, summary view thingy, uh, so it doesn't have the full items where where in Volto that uh, broke in this uh, in the training documentation. The search options here, search uh, full objects and metadata fields are used with that, and I'm pretty sure that it has to do with uh, a default being switched from either full objects to metadata fields or to nothing, which is uh, like the default, I guess. Yeah, that's it. Um, so I have this view here also with the uh, different talks and with these nice labels. And the next chapter is a bit more relaxing because we talk about programming for Plone in a more abstract way. Uh, so, so this is, doesn't have, it actually has a crazy example that you should develop uh, at home at the end uh, but um, it is it's just to teach you best practices uh, what to do when you do plone development so there are um, you might have realized already that plone uh, the code base for the back end in this case is huge uh, um, that's because there's more than 20 years of history if you count zoop uh, Plone is 20 years plus the years that Zoop existed uh, before that and CMF. Uh, all of that is uh, in, in, in the stack and the stack is huge. And to be able to manage uh, these multi this multitude of features, there are a couple of uh, best practices that we want to uh, get across. Number one is to use Plone API for backend development. I'm talking about the backend development. So this is not the REST API, but it's Plone API. And it's not there to decouple Plone um, from, from your development, but it is sim similar to that. It is, it's there to give a shorthand well-documented best practices, easy to import and use API methods for the 20% uh, of the features in Plone that you use 80% of the time. So for example, creating content, there are actually, there are a multitude of ways how to create content in Python, but the way you should always do that is use a uh, Plone REST API uh, create content method. It, we link to the some of the examples in the documentation here. It's from Plone import API um, and API content create. That's how you do that. Then you pass the content type, uh, the title and where this item should exist. And you can pass any kinds of ad additional attributes to uh, create, to populate this content type. Um, same sending an email, there are uh, API methods, uh, at least three to do that, not in Plone API, but various approaches through uh, various layers of uh, code and uh, sending emails, just use API portal send email. And it uses, that's the point, even though in the backend stuff might change, the Plone API, the Python API stays stable and uh, will be updated if, I don't know, uh, the secure mail host will be replaced with the super secure mail host, or at some point uh, the mail host was replaced by the secure mail host. And you don't have to care about that because the Plone API methods stay the same. And it's, it's not like you need it, it obviously creates a little overhead 
in uh, because there's a wrapper and it does some checking if you have the attributes right uh, the, uh, the 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 arguments right and stuff like that but it's it's not like you're writing a system that needs to send billions of emails per minute uh, so you can you can spare this uh, microsecond that is required to uh, to throw your code through plone api it's not a performance uh, deal breaker uh, and so on. There's a, a lot of features that you can uh, use in Plone API. And with Plone API version two, there is a completely new module that you can use in uh, Plone six uh, that deals with relations. It's not mentioned here yet, uh, but there is a whole chapter on relations, which we're not going to get to in this training. But um, where is it? Chapter 43. And there are a couple of examples how to deal with relations in code. Where is that? In code here. And you can create and inspect, uh, get, uh, create a CRUD, basically. Uh, create, um, read, and delete uh, relations uh using the plone api which would be much more complicated if you wouldn't have these helper methods in here uh so this is use read the documentation for plone api um the code examples of this training always use the plone api when it's uh when there is a method available but plone being huge and i said it's the 80 percent of features that you use at uh, 20% uh, of features that they use 80% of those time, which means there's at least 80, actually it's probably 98% of additional features that you just don't use that often that are somewhere else. For example, in the portal tools, um, I already, uh, you already got to know two tools. One is the type tool where we registered the content type, which happened through generic setup with the XML file and also the catalog tool where we added a new index also via uh, XML. But these are obviously Python uh, tools that have their own API and that can be used. One example, which is not exposed by the Plone API where you obviously can also search the catalog. It's API content.find. You can find uh, any kind of content. But there is a method in portal catalog called unrestricted search results, which will return all objects, even though you might not be allowed to access them. Because, for example, you don't have permissions to use uh, to see them, uh, or uh, they are outdated. So the, the expiration date has already passed, which means by the default search of Plone, they would not be returned. By unrestricted search results, will return everything but not the content objects. So there's lots of complexity there in the portal catalog. It doesn't return the real objects. It would be stupid. Imagine Google would always return the full uh, objects. That would mean Google would have to uh, keep the whole internet, everything uh, in their search engine and return the page to you. No, it returns a representation of that page. And in the portal catalog in Plone, it's called the brain because it only holds the most important information, not the fleshy, flabby parts, but only the, uh, the title and the description and whatever is defined as metadata on the brain. Just one example. Other things are portal setup, which is the tool that is actually used to install an add-on. Uh, you remember we uninstalled and installed the Plone site um, um, PlonConf site uh, add-on multiple times already. All of that can be done in Python as well. And there are a couple of methods in portal setup uh, that can be used. Um, oh, this should go away because in Plone 6, this doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, we should update that and so on and so forth. There's a lot of uh, API methods in these tools that make up Plone. If you go to the, uh, why do I have that here? Because I needed to upload some image. Um, if you go to the back end, you can see these tools in Plone in the ZMI lying around, obviously not in the user interface. Uh, there, the, a lot of the features is exposed in control panels, 
but some are not. And obviously some methods are not, and you want to call them in Python. We can do that. All everything, basically everything that starts with portal underscore is a tool that has its own API portal setup. Here it is. It has lots of features uh, through the web, but all of that is also accessible in Python. And uh, similar, something uh, there is one exa uh, example that is the mail host and ACL users don't start with uh, portal underscore, but there are also tools. This is the uh, access control uh, layer uh, where you where users and groups and roles and stuff is stored and stuff like that. Yeah, that is uh, the uh, the you find methods there. And if uh, if you're uncertain how to do something and you, that you need to uh, achieve in Plone, um, check how Plone does it. So read the code of the Plone core that uh, does this. Uh, and uh, you can you can from reading the code you will find out how to how to do that. A lot of that is also documented. Some mentions it are in the in this training, uh, but obviously there's such a, a ton of code. Um, just writing it all down wouldn't wouldn't really help. It would make the whole thing un, un, unwieldy. Um, then uh, here's a weird example uh, because some I'm not going to go into that. Read that. It is it is it is a it's a it's a good good idea to read that because then you learn how these tools build are built on top of each other. So there's Zoop, there's CMF, and then there's Plone, and there's actually three multi uh, three levels of inheritance for the catalog. Uh, and every inheritance level adds new features uh, or tweaks a couple of features. So it might get super confusing in the beginning. But once you know that all these are stacked on top of each other and the one that you use when you say, hey, get me the portal catalog, that's then the one from Plone that inherits from CMF, that inherits from Zoop, uh, things get slowly a bit clearer. Uh, the second uh, thing that we want to approach here is debugging. Um, more often than not, stuff is going wrong. Um, that the same that is true for Volto and React development as well for backend development. Uh, in backend uh, development, there uh, are a couple of tools uh, that really help you with that. The most important one being PDB, that's the Python debugger that comes with Python uh, by default. Um, and it helps you really dig into the code. I did that a couple times already when I showed you using uh, this slash PDB view. I'll get to that in a second. But before you uh, figure out, uh, try to figure out what is going wrong, uh, Python throws a trace back at you or writes something in the log and you can read that trace back. And more often than not, um, it, it is, it is I, I can't stress that enough. You need, uh, Mark uh, asks if, uh, how can you reinstall a product in Plone 6? You can't, you need to uninst uh, uninstall and install in if, if you want the whole reinstall thing, but basically everything is replaced by portal setup. So what you do is to you reapply a profile. Um, if you want, now I'm not gonna show that in the user interface, but portal setup has a lot of export and import uh, features in the ZMI where you can say, I want to rerun this uh, profile, this, this part of the profile, this step in the profile, just the catalog indexes that are uh, registered for this add-on. This is uh, the default way how to do that. And there are helpers in CMF Plone uh, get installer and get installer has all kind uh, returns the portal setup tool uh, that then has API methods that help you with reinstalling products or which reinstalling products actually means reapplying uh, the profile uh, steps that you have these XML steps and also running the Python code that goes along with that and that is registered with that profile. Uh, we haven't done that yet. That happens in the later chapter. There is a chapter on that that I'm super fond of. It is called Upgrade Steps here, 32. 
I will not gonna get uh, we're not gonna get to that, but you should read that. And uh, so when you have a package that you install, you can run arbitrary code, create whole like a uh, whole mountains of content and configuration and stuff. Uh, that happens very very often. Uh, that you need. I mean, it happens often that you need that. Um, I was uh, talking about uh, debugging. So <coughs> what I wanted to say is. Um, and I can't stress this enough, when you get a traceback and you're not 100, I, I'm talking about 100, I'm talking not talking about 99%, talking about, unless you are 100% certain what just happened and how to fix that, take the 10 seconds it takes and read the traceback, the error message, because it is so often that, uh, the case that you're 99% sure what happened and you're wrong. And you waste so much time by chasing down your pro your high probability what's wrong. And you could have saved a lot of time by investing these 10 seconds of reading the traceback and say, oh, it's something completely different. Um, so please, please, please read the tracebacks. Um, other tips, use PDB PP++. Uh, it's an excellent uh, problem replacement for uh, PDB that has syntax highlighting and stuff like that. Um, use for development PDB debug mode, which is the add-on that we use uh, here in the training. It is in your, it's there in your build out. So when you go to a, a site and there is an error at some point, I didn't have an error today. I had one yesterday. Uh, yeah, that was manually triggered. I didn't have an uh, error, but the point is when you have this tool, uh, this thing installed, uh, PDB debug mode, it gives you a PDB at the point that the traceback happened where the error appeared. And then you're in Python. And since this training is mostly intended for Python developers or those who want to become them, uh, this, is, this is where you want to be. That's where the error actually happened. And then you can inspect the stack trace and all that. There's like, uh, we could talk for hours about that. I'm not gonna go into that. Um, but um, the PDB debug mode also has a second feature, which is really good. And I already, um, I already used that. Let me uh, go to one of the talks. Here is a talk that I'm gonna give on Wednesday, I think. And I'm gonna call a view called PDB on that. So the it traverses, let's not go into that. That is more for classic clone. There's a browser view called PDB, registered as PDB, and it triggers a PDB a trace, a, 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 a breakpoint uh, at that point. And self context is then uh, the object that I'm uh, triggering this uh, on. And I can inspect that and see. Uh, it's a dict. All items look in most items in Python have a dict syntax to inspect them as attributes, and then you can go there and figure out okay, what's wrong with the modification date? What's why is this uh, thing not rendered properly because the guy forgot to add the the ad before the GitHub uh, the before the Twitter uh, name and stuff like that. Um, by the way. Uh, this is uh, here, this is, I talked about security yesterday quick, shortly. Uh, and this is, these are the attributes on the objects which are important uh, and are checked to before you can actually do something as a user uh, with this object. So if you're looking, if, if you're trying to view that, Plone reads this view permission attribute and checks if the current user is has one of these roles uh, that are listed in this tuple, and so on and so forth. So that is uh, that is a very important tool as a de uh, developer. Not gonna go into any of the other details. You just just should just um, read up on that. And if you don't use Sentry, you should start using Sentry. Or there are similar tools uh, as a service. Sentry is open source. You could host it yourself. If you are, if you dare, uh, and it's uh, it catches your tracebacks and the local variables that come with every step of the stack trace in the traceback. If you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry. 
<laughs> once you uh, have a sentry and once you uh, have a site in production and you have errors and you use sentry to inspect them, you'll understand what I mean that this is, can be a total lifesaver. Uh, we're not going to do the exercise, but we're certainly going to talk about programming best practices for Volto. Uh, and Katya will talk a bit about that. We have we didn't write any of that down, but uh, maybe there are some 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 bits and pieces of wisdom that you'd like to share. Sorry, you catch me. <laughs> um, can I think of this? I sure not prepared. Are you catch me on the wrong foot? That's that's not a problem. I'll, I'll I'll just move on to the next chapter, which is very. It's it's basically the same. It's like it's best practices for development. And one of the best practices for development is get to know your editor. Um, let's make a short poll uh, in the Slack. Please type the name of your editor. Um, I'll I'll start uh, using uh, typing. I I used to. Yeah. Wow. What I expected. Oh, <laughs> Atom. Atom. Yeah, Atom. Uh, no one Emacs. Paul, what do you use? Oh, yeah. So do a lot of people uh, use VS Code for JavaScript and uh, Sublime for Python? Probably. Or they're in uh, like... Uh, halfway between switching to VS Code full time, I'm I'm not 100% decided yet on 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 VS Code for Python, but I really like it. So so the main point of this is uh, no matter which editor you use, Vim, Emacs, uh, TextMate, uh, Atom, uh, VS Code, PyCharm, um, and whatnot, that is fine. That's excellent. But you need to invest time to, to, to get to uh, know your editor and to configure it to work uh, properly with the, the sheer amount of code that you, you're dealing with. That means you need to uh, be able to um, find code and classes uh, in, in your project. Uh, you need to be able to uh, go to definition. Um, let me show you just one example uh, here in my backend code. I configured that if you use VS Code, you can use uh, the uh, ZoPy. I haven't talked about that. That's a Python um, interpreter that can be is configured by your build out. You can use the ZoPy interpreter as the Python uh, that is selected for your um, for your project. And that makes sure that all the code that you have, which is a lot, if you look at the whole stack, is importable. So when I when you go to your behavior, these are not don't have these red curlies under. And if you go over that, it says class decorator version of class provides, whatever that means, or form field provider. And when you click right, go to definition, you actually go there and see, hey, that's a marker interface for schemata that provide form fields. Isn't that what Philip just said when he talked about that? I could have just read the documentation that is in the code that I'm using instead of listening to this training and so on and so forth. So all of this stuff, uh, including the, the, the schema fields here, the, when, it, when you have an editor that is um, uh, registered properly, you can just go to the definition of this class. And um, so for the code that you have written yourself, that is not, I don't, that doesn't get you 100% of the way because you've already written that. The point is you need to use that more often than not with the code you have not written. So going, for example, to a document uh, or what, what did we have? Um, metadata 
XM uh, metadata py in the dexterity to figure out okay what are they using here directives what is this weird directive thing let's go to that see what's there this is the directives see what's going on with the whatever omitted plugin i have no idea what that is at the moment uh, because i'm going through that too fast but you can read and if your editor is properly configured you can walk through the whole code of plone uh, using uh, as long as it's python uh, and using using uh, a, the editor's uh, features um, i said as long as it's python because the zop component architecture is not python it's zzml so the the registration of items in the zop component architecture is uh, is something different and there you have may have code where you're looking up the a named utility or a view and then you just need your search and that's also super important name equals um let's say uh what 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 kind of what are we going to look for um i was a plone dot uh title name from title name oh already there here. So if it's properly configured, you can find it in configure ZML. Uh, here, name from title, or there it seems like there's another one, name from file name. Uh, so when do we need name from file name? Just short bit of trivia of plone logic. Uh, when you upload an image, uh, as opposed to when you create a page, um, for a page, the title is a required field because if you if you leave everything empty, Plon has zero data and has no idea how to create a URL from that. Um, but if you upload an image, uh, a file or an image, you don't want to be bothered with creating a title for that because this is binary data. Please just eat it. So there is a different behavior that is enabled for files and image that's called name from file name because the only required field for images and files is the file and image field. And from the uh, file name that uh, from the file that you upload, uh, the URL, that is the name in this case, uh, will be automatically generated. That's just a bit of trivia that you could learn if you follow this kind of logic um, and inspect these. Um, similar things are true for VS for JavaScript development. You can go to definition and inspect all these crazy things here. I just hoover over use selector. And it explains to me what it does because all of these, uh, yeah, it's well documented. Um, Katya, do you have any additional tips? How to what what add-ons do you really need in your editor uh, or in your browser when you develop for Volto? Uh, uh, I use this on um, what you said that I hover over and uh, see the info about what, what I'm using now. And <clears throat> um, just one single thing, um, I use an add-on what lets me define some snippets. So oh, what nice. I do is I, I often use the console for debugging, the, um, displaying some part of the information, and I type debug, and so it pastes me uh, my custom snippet console dot debug, and I can type in um, uh, um, a fixed string and a variable name. So this is uh, such things come in very handy, but it's completely independent from React or Volto. Um, yeah. Excellent. So they, uh, yeah, and yesterday we already talked about the, uh, the, the React developer tool, tools in the browser uh, that you obviously need, uh, same as the developer tools that come with uh, Firefox or Chrome um, when, when you do like classic uh, or even here, it, you, you want to maybe maybe you want to inspect the HTML here. So this is 
it may be a React application, but uh, in the end, this is HTML that comes uh, that is created, um, and you want to figure out what what's going wrong here. Uh, you want to debug some of the JavaScript uh, errors that are thrown at you, but uh, you probably know know all of that uh, yeah, maybe, already. Yeah, maybe one more thing. May, uh, you can uh, show it. Um, you're still on the talk list. You, we have seen the developer tools for React itself, where we can inspect the components, and we have a second thing for the store. Do you have installed the Redux helper? Uh, I it had it, it, but I actually don't have it anymore. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I need that. Uh, we have seen that we use a Redux action that stores data in the store, and we can inspect the store and see what is fetched. In fact, a yes, Redux Dev Tools. Redux Dev Tools. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, I use most of the time Chrome. Yep, they. Uh, that is that is true. A lot of JavaScript developers use Chrome. Paul wrote something. Yeah, I have. Um, that is a, that's a good point. I configured my VS Code to run uh, black as well, which is super annoying uh, when you edit something in Plone or Zoop, not your own code, and you just do some some small change and you press save, and everything is blacked, uh, formatted, uh, mm -hmm. and you need to undo that because uh, you you don't want that in your code. These changes. So here is my Redux developer thingy. Hopefully it is there now. Where can I find it? Yep, here, Redux. So let's see what we can see there. Katya, walk me through that. What can I do here? On the left side, uh, you see the dispatched actions. If you scroll down, you see in the last one. And um, this is also uh, always, um, uh, search content says that we use the search content action and success means that it's already the, the level where it's not pending anymore, but successfully uh, finished. And now you're, uh, yes, on um, <clears throat> uh, what you see on the red, uh, right side is the diff of the, the um, what changed in the store, the part. And you see that we uh, this action changed the part search sub request conference talks. That's a part we are interested in. And you see that it uh, <clears throat> gives you the total number of fetched items, the items itself. And uh, in the code, we took this part items and skipped uh, um, iterated over the items. So this is uh, pretty cool. And um, if on the left side you do not see search content success, but <clears throat> search content failure, then uh, you have a problem and you you have to yeah fix the error. Um, yeah. Excellent. Cool tool. Yeah, great. Um, so yeah, get to know your editor. Get to know your terminal. Um, I use uh, iTerm and uh, ZShell. But you should just be able to use grep or ag or whatever you fancy to find code in your in, in this huge code base even if you don't have an editor available for example when you're on a server a client server where you can't uh, log in uh, that you don't have uh, on on your local machine so um, some uh, basic vi or vim uh, know-how is super important and yeah this is this is an endless task and you you never end learning and, uh, I started using uh, Eclipse uh, then Aptana something um, Textmate that's uh, Atom Sublime and now I'm switching to VS Code and every time I need to learn something new, new uh, shortcut commands and stuff like that. So it keeps your brain um, engaged as well. Okay, um, it's half past five. I suggest, um, since this was a super relaxing part, you could 
uh, say this was a break. Um, and we're not doing another break because we only have 25, 35 minutes left. And I want you to get most of the uh, out of this training. Uh, so we'll just go to the next chapter and um, power through. Also, we want to uh, actually we want to stop here and do a question and answer session. But let's let's not do that now. Let's say we'll leave twenty minutes for questions and answers. And I, 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 I please please think of answer uh, questions and answers. Uh, well, not the answers, obviously, only the questions that uh, Katya and me uh, can hopefully answer. Uh, and we also want to talk a little about the Plone community before we let you go. I know a lot of uh, the people in this training are already old hands, but uh, so, so Paul and Laurent and Stefan and uh, whoever, we don't need to tell you these guys things, but there are probably people who have never worked uh, a lot with Plone are new to that. And it's really important. Uh, I think it's important for us to tell them a bit about the community and how it works. So quickly, uh, custom search. Um, in Plone Classic, uh, there is no custom search. You can use the search, obviously, and just uh, search things, clone, and you have a nice uh, search results that you can then filter and sort, and that's about it. And oops, I can obviously download something that I don't want to download. Um, and uh, that is good, but sometimes you need more. And there are add-ons that give you this functionality. I'm not gonna um, go into too much detail, but just one example. Uh, from a project we, which we did, just did uh, where you can search for uh, high pressure cleaners. Let's switch to English since we're talking about English. This is a add-on called EEA faceted navigation. It's in this case highly styled obviously, but uh, this is Plone content and we can filter the results. This is also Plone content and you can filter that by various values in the index. Um, here, again, I changed something and I changed something and it does a catalog search. And the cool thing about that, that why I show you this is this add-on EEA faceted navigation um, allows you to, uh, this is, there are no screenshots here, so I can't show you that at the moment. It allows you to configure such a search that you just saw without programming. Again, that's one of the powers of Plone. It uh, there is a lot of tools that gives you give you user interfaces or uh, and that you can configure a very complex search without having to program that. Uh, this is the EA faceted navigation is not a framework to program your searches. It is a, a add-on where you can actually use the the mouse and the browser to configure, to click a search that you can then uh, ship to your client. Uh, it's extremely powerful. And there are a lightweight uh, alternatives uh, collection filter. And in Volto, in Plone 6, there is something built in that is almost as powerful as that. Uh, that's, it's called the search block. Um, I'm not sure if I should, do, should demo that. Do you want to demo that, Katya, or should I just show that quickly? You're muted, I think. Just, just do it. Okay. So yeah. I'll, um, when I added this, uh, <coughs> hang on, I'll just create a new page. Uh, page with search block. You can add a couple of blocks. We only saw listing, image, and text so far. Um, there is more, there is video, and there is a table of contents. There is maps, hero, which is like a huge image with text, table, I think we saw that, uh, HTML, and there's search. It's pretty hidden, and it's pretty new, and it's pretty powerful. And it can, uh, it's basically at the moment, it is a listing of all content. Once I save, I have all of this and I can filter the results by, if I say talk, 
um, it filters the results by everything that has that. But even more, I can configure additional criteria here. And these criteria are not like in the listing block, uh, like uh, these are uh, define the display data, but I can define criteria, uh, um, facets in this case, not criteria. Criteria are for uh, the default listing. Uh, what is actually what you are able to see uh, and then filter, but a facet is a uh, is a filter option. So let's add a label. Uh, let's say type uh, filter by type. Make that a checkbox, and you actually you already see that when you do that. Uh, and say uh, this is a multiple choice field and hit save and I'm done. And now can I have all the content in the site because I didn't define any uh, base criteria and I can say, okay, show me pages, only show me folders, uh, show me collections. There is no collection, uh, show me talks only. And um, you can add multiple criteria, you can add uh, filters, additional filters, uh, and so on. So it's super powerful. Um, let's have, where are the filters? Here are the filters. Show sorting, search button, sort by uh, sortable title. Uh, I think you get the idea that this is a pretty powerful tool. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it comes in Plone by default in Plone 6. So a lot of the uh, use cases where you used to use an add-on uh, is now available uh, out of the box uh, for you in Plone. So I'm gonna delete that page before we, oopsie, move on. Search block, delete, yes. Okay, that's, um, I, I would really love to do that, but I don't think we have the time. Uh, let's do a, before we go to the question and answer section, we should do a, a short sneak preview of what you would get if you would either do the whole training online or hire us to do in-house trainings or um, come to the conference next year and visit a two-day uh, eight hours twice, so 16 hour training. We're not doing any breaks in 16 hours. No, we actually, we do breaks. We go for lunch and we have coffee and we have beers afterwards. So actually um, consider going there next year. Uh, so in the next chapter that we would do and that we did last year, you can actually watch that as a video from last year. And also the next chapter, uh, we add a new feature to Actually, I'm totally, Katya, you should have stopped me uh, because it is half past five and not half past six. I was, um, and nobody said anything. I was also eager to go uh, to go for drinks and uh, or back to your family. We actually have one and a half hours left. Um, yeah, we're not stopping okay, at six. I misunderstood you. Come again? Sorry, I misunderstood you with the half an hour. I thought you want to um, do the question and answers yes now and not at the end. Oh, now let's do that at the end. Um, so we have actually one and a half hour, more hours, so we're not going to do a sneak preview. Uh, we'll just go on uh, with uh, the next chapter. I'm very sorry for this confusion. Um, um, yeah whatever. Uh, whose chapter is that? Is that mine or yours, Katya? It's your chapter. Okay. But, um, I will do that. I think um, for me, it would be important to, to see the last chapter that we scheduled. Um, can you have a shot? We, we scheduled the, uh, we... that is the last one we scheduled. Um, that is vocabularies. So um, are we in time now? Uh, we won't be in time to make uh, to make to finish this chapter because that is pretty complex, um, okay. complex thing I'd say. So um, 
So I think we should do uh, number, uh, chapter 13 and then do a sneak preview of what else is to come, come and uh, maybe pick some highlights that uh, you or me uh, think are really interesting and are something to take away uh, until you do your own trainings. Uh, um, yeah, when you do clone development, sorry. Okay, um, I'd say let's do uh, this chapter and then have a break and then go to sneak preview and question and answers. Okay, so uh, the thing is, uh, so the, the conference is approaching and you have um, at a later chapter enabled a feature where um, uh, anonymous users are actually allowed to register and create uh, content in a certain folder and submit talks to you. Or you could use Google Forms to submit the talks and then just load them into Plone uh, from, from JSON, which is also fine, uh, but we we'll want to eat our own dog food. So that's what we're doing in a later chapter that is called user generated content. I have no idea where it is. It is somewhere here. It should happen there. Um, so imagine that happened and we have talks and we realize, oh crap, uh, conference is on uh, October 23rd until something, but we can't store a display or store this data uh, that a talk is actually happening at a certain uh, time and place. So now we decided, ah, oh, shit, we need a start and end date for each uh, talk, uh, be that a keynote, a training, or a uh, normal talk. Um, all of these need these dates. So there are a couple of options. Again, we could just amend our schema and uh, go to the uh, Python schema and say, uh, I want... Uh, start date, end date, and that's a date field then, go to the training documentation uh, for dexterity uh, reference, uh, the dexterity reference and check out what's going on there uh, to copy and paste that. And yeah, but we're not doing that. Uh, instead, uh, we realize that Plone already has events. Uh, we actually added one yesterday Day. There was the deadline for talk submission. And when I click here, uh, that's what I did. I got these start and event end thingies and I got more. And while looking at that, it gets me thinking because there's the whole day thingy and then there's the open end thingy and then there's recurrence and all this kind of uh, additional features. And I get, it dawns on me that this actually would make sense in the context of a conference as well. Because um, guess what has is open-ended at a conference? Obviously not this training. We have to stop at five or quarter past seven um, and not a talk. But what happens at a conference as well? There is a party and it is open-ended. It is it the party at the Plon conference stops when you can't take anymore, usually. Uh, and uh, the Plon community is well known across the globe for uh, having a pretty, uh, pretty, pretty strong tolerance for partying. Uh, so that basically never ends. And also sprints, they don't, they start uh, when the first person comes and they actually end when the last one drops uh, dead. Uh, so that would be a whole day event. So you need all these features. Um, so we could just copy and paste these fields from the event type. Um, yeah, let's figure out how that works. So the event content type, uh, we're seeing that here. So the event content type is obviously defined in the back end. And uh, let's see, event, let's look for that. Oh God, that's probably too much. So how was a schema defined? Uh, remember it was class I something, probably I event. Let's see, is there something? Mm -hmm. There is something. There is a, there are a couple of packages. Plone event, I event interface. That looks good. 
Uh, that's not a schema, it's a marker interface. So that's not helpful. There is a portlet. We haven't talked about portlets. We don't want that as well. Uh, there's another portlet. Weird, why do we have two portlets? Mm, let's just ignore that. Behaviors, ha, haven't we heard that already? Event basic, event recurrence, event location. Okay, so it seems like event start, end, whole day and open end are not defined in a content type schema, but in a behavior. Hmm. Okay, how does that work? So let's use the browser to search I event basic in ZCML because a behavior is registered, the schema of the behavior is registered in ZCML. So here, there is a registration for this behavior. It is in the file plone app event dx for, I guess, dexterity configures that ZML. It has a name, plone event basic. And I can now uh, again search this time in an XML file. Who uses this behavior? Oh, the event content type. Uh, seems to do that from plone app content types profiles default types event. It has this behavior enabled. So you remember that's like our content type. So going backwards from the, the feature that is in plone that we decided, hey, we should reuse that feature. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. We found, okay, the event type actually uses that. We found where it is. We found how, it, uh, how, how it's called. And we can now uh, reuse this behavior. It's called um, e plone event basic. Uh, we could have skipped all of these parts and just gone to the user interface. I'll do that now and inspect. But that's like, it's the, the developer way to do this. Uh, a bit show, show offy. Uh, you go to the event type inspect the schema, uh, realize that a lot of stuff is inherited from behaviors and go to the behaviors and see event basic is enabled here. And then you go to your talk content type and you just do the same. Say, oh, event basic. Why not click? Why not save? Why not go to our talks and why not click here, edit and figure out if that actually worked and voila, it worked. So again, no programming involved, just uh, knowing the features that are already there and um, getting uh, the wild idea to reuse these features for your benefit. Uh, and then you can say, okay, this talk uh, will happen on Wednesday or whatever. Yeah, let's say Wednesday the day for that 5 p.m is fine uh save not displayed uh, okay now um we have the data it seems to be there it seems to be when we edit it it seems to be stored so all is good and in the back end it will probably since we didn't define a custom uh since we didn't define a uh, a custom view in Plone Classic, it would probably also be displayed. Here we have it, event starts, event ends. So there's data and it's, it's there, but in Volto, it's not displayed yet. So, okay, we could go to our um, view and uh, amend that and add this information to the view. Okay, let's just do that. Uh, by the way, let's go back uh, a step and do the right thing and go to our profiles default types talk xml and add the behavior here same as plone conf configured plone dot oops plone event basic uh, so this makes sure that this behavior is enabled whenever I install this uh, this package. It is uh, the database uh, state would be exactly the same. 
if you click the button or if you add this and reinstall the package. So there is no additional, if you, if you already did that on a production server, you don't need to reinstall the package. This is, it's, that is, that's fine. It's not the same case as if you created a content type through the web then, uh, or created in Python. That's a different story. Uh, so that's fine. Let's switch uh, our editor to the front end and go to the talk uh, view. And we could go there and uh, let's just see what happens. Let's do that. Let's pretend here content Twitter start. That was the attribute that was used there. Save and see what happens. Hey, actually the data is there. That's like 27th and that's not today. So it's obviously correct. And 5, uh, 5 p.m. Uh, is fine. So we have the data. So we could just go ahead and start writing some logic that uh, shows me uh, the start and end date when this event happens. And very soon you will realize that this will be actually much, much harder than you thought because a training is uh goes for two days so you have like saturday the something five uh 3 p.m in the afternoon until sunday uh there but uh, maybe not because it's two days uh so what how how are you going to display that and a lot of question marks going to appear in your head uh and the party uh, what are you going to do uh can you, are you going to say uh, the, use the data that is in the database because open end means it goes until zero, like at the end of the day, if it's only a one day party. So it starts at 4 p.m. or I don't know, 7 p.m. until zero, 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 zero. How do you display that? Well, then people would expect that have to go home. But if you say the party is open-ended, what do you do? It's like four o'clock in the morning the next day, okay? Do you display a, a Saturday uh, 6 p.m. until Sunday 4 a.m.? That would be weird. You don't want that. So if it's open-end, you don't want to display an end date. Uh, you have a lot of if statements there. And doing that in JavaScript uh, or in Python or in HTML, that's just a super heavy nightmare. So how does Plone solve this issue? Because obviously they have events and they already display events in some way. So, hey, there's this box. So when I change the deadline, it's not from 10 to four and it is open-ended and it's a whole day. So someday it just ends. This is what I want. Okay, so let's do another uh, instance of stealing from those who know best, which is um, uh, the Plone developers know best in this case. They wrote this. Let's use the developer tool, uh, React uh, developer tools, and inspect this box here. We could use, we could go to the uh, event view and find that and look for that. But it would be probably helpful to see uh, what it, how, how it's structured. So there's the event view. You have the, um, click here's the event view. That's the item. It has all the dates, so end. And at some, somewhere at the bottom is start. So there's the data. There's the container. And then there's a seg segment. What is that? It, this doesn't really help me. I have a header and I have a when. When, that looks interesting. So what is a when? Let's go event view JSX 87. Let's go there. Let's see what, what, what happens in event view JSX line 87 when it says when. So omelet. Our content types are in uh, the views, are in component theme view event view. 
which line was it? 87. 87, when? Oh, that looks good. That's not a lot of programming. Uh, so this seems to be a component. Uh, where does it come from? It's imported from event dates info. So cool, let's just reuse that um, and see if we go wrong. We could also just go into theme view event dates info. Is that the thing that we want? It looks very much like it. It gets these arguments and it does all the logic that I just talked about when the, and also it does take care of uh, internationalization. So you don't get weird uh, things when you want that in German, for example. So, okay, let's just copy and paste this part into our talk view. Uh, we're not using the recurrence because all our talks only happen once. So this is probably right. Then uh, where is the when again? Default when, here's the when. So let's put that somewhere in the, uh, where should we put that? Where's our talk? Deadline for talk submission. Uh, oh, that's the event. That's not a talk. Let's go to a talk. Talks, do I have a trace back? Oh, obviously I have a trace back because I, uh, I recompiled, but I didn't get a trace back. I changed something. Yeah, still renders. So yeah, put that here next to the, uh, how they call these tags. Well, the tags, the tags are audience. Let's put them for that. And content. Content audience item. Yeah, that seems that looks correct. Let's save and see if I get a trace back. I don't get a trace back. Let's render it. Nice. I get the date looks correct. That's fine. So let's do some styling now. Um, here I have a, I steal, I could go into more detail, but I decide that I want to put the audience and the date in a block similar to the one for events to the right. So I steal some more from the event view, including the segment, uh, which is already imported from UI React. Uh, it seems, let's see if that is true. Segment is already in, uh, imported, that's correct. So I can just uh, take this whole part and put it before the description. Uh, remove my when thingy, including the audience and also the audience here before and before the description. I hope I didn't break anything now. Save. There is a curly red thing, so header is not defined. That is seems to be missing here. Um, that is from uh, no curly thingies anymore. Okay, let's see what happened. Yay, we've done it. So we have this nice when thingy. I've written that just by hand here, header dividing sub, stolen from the, uh, from the event view, uh, the date, and then there is a, uh, the dividing that's the uh, dividing sub here. There is no dividing sub here. Then audience again with a dividing sub. You see this line, this short line, and below the line, uh, basically the same code for uh, that iterates over the audience. So, so I didn't write any of that code myself. I stole it. I stole the feature, and I stole the uh, visual representation. And I reuse the whole component, the when component. So I didn't have to think uh, it up myself. Uh, I just combined it in a slightly different way than uh, the plone default would do that. So yeah, that is uh, basically it. Uh, 
Oh yeah, if we have uh, at a later chapter, we add rooms and then they add, uh, they end up in here too. So we have this nice block of the most important information, when, where, and for whom. And if you need more of the details or about who that is, you see that in uh, below the, the talk. Uh, so that is um, a fine thing. Uh, there is a, uh, a tweak there that is doesn't work yet in Volto. Uh, the point being that we are still planning to do this conference. So next year, so uh, but we're at a stage where we, okay, now we have dates, we need to display them, all is good, just display them. But next year, when we commit our code and we create the site and people submit talks, um, then uh, they get uh, this edit form and they, they wanna submit a talk to a conference and they get this field where it says when your talk is. And so I don't even know when the conference is. I just wanna submit a talk. That's not my job. Um, there is at the moment, there would be, there is no easy fix for that. There would be a uh, fix in Plon Classic Basically, this is not secret data. It's just that it's a field that can be empty. It doesn't hurt when it's empty. And we just uh, not, don't display that in CSS for users who don't uh, have a certain role. In this case, uh, the user contributor doesn't see, see uh, this field, but the reviewer does. This is just some CSS. The po problem is that in Volto, uh, these uh, the roles of the users are not yet uh, exposed as CSS classes in the body of the uh, of the main template, which is the case in in Plum Classic. So if you go here and you inspect the HTML, you have the body tag, and you have lots of classes here, and they're super useful. And one of these classes is user role owner, user role manager, user role authenticated. And with these classes, you can easily hide and show data um, as long as it's not secret. Obviously, you don't use this feature to, uh, to, to hide data, and that would be stupid. Um, that that uh, hide data that is uh, that is sensitive in some way <coughs> but this is this is not sensitive data um okay so there is uh, some more um uh information on how to this uh, how to display uh this date in the listing uh obviously we have the talk list view and the talk list view the talks now have these beautiful dates here um nice but the talk list view doesn't have that yet and um yeah that would be the exercise and uh, it's your task uh, to solve that at home uh that's your homework and yeah we used a existing behavior of plon to add new fields again um we reuse something we haven't we didn't write our own behavior in this case uh, we just reused something that existed uh, we used an existing view component uh, to display the date by the way in plon classic we would do exactly the same we would look at the way uh, events are displayed in plon classic and find out what what uh, snippet um is uh, what, what kind of code is used in events in Plon Classic to display the date and the location and all that information and reuse that, import that and use that in our training, uh, in, in our template. It's also a one-liner uh, basic or two-liner maybe. It's not a lot of uh, code. So it's exactly the same in the uh, like sister chapter, turning talks into events for Classic UI that you can link to here. So, um, we didn't have to write any uh, any any daytime fields uh, or indexers for that. Um, by the way, uh, you need an index for the daytime to actually list all dates in a uh, in a uh, by by date because you need to search the catalog, have them ordered. You don't want to do that by yourself. You just want to tell the catalog, "Hey, give me all talks, sort on, start." 
done and it's stored, sorted on start date. And uh, with this information, you can uh, create a calendar actually that is, um, it should be a chapter at somewhere at the bottom. I gave a talk about that. Uh, maybe it's not yet a chapter in the training. So any questions about that? Oh God, Paul, yes. Um, the order of fields is uh, stored in a tagged value, um, which is a, it's basically a list, uh, additional information on the schema. And there is a, there is a thread in community plone org uh, about, hiding and showing uh, tagged uh, um, fields because that is also a tag value. And I think the same approach could be used uh, to modify uh, the order of behaviors. The point is when you reuse a feature like that, um, moving that field to a different field set, I think that is the, the, the task. Uh, field set, uh, moving behavior to field to a different field set. Yeah, that's the one. And there is, there are more than that. There's a, a lot of discussion on, on that issue because it's actually, it's not easy. It's, it is, it is super hard. It is also hard to, um, but let's say that modify, uh, Let's see, let me find something. Uh, override schema cron when that might be that. Um, no, there was one uh, that I where I answered recently uh, about the best practice, how that works. So, yeah. Uh, there is no, uh, I don't have a perfect answer for that. Um, if you really re reuse stuff um, and then you want to modify the behavior of the stuff that you reuse, um, there is uh, the level of complexity uh, in is increased, uh, increases very fast at that point. Um, because um, then you only want to move this behavior field into a different field set or before another field for this content type, but not for the other content type. And um, yeah, the complexity is, is growing. So if at some point um, you will be, uh, it will be easier to just write a field yourself that you then can configure and say, this is a required field. Your start date would be required, for example, for this content type. Um, the good thing is you wouldn't have to uh, write a custom uh, index, uh, your own index, because the indexers are, uh, in, are made in that way that whenever there is a field called start, it, it is the data is stored in the daytime index. Uh, in a daytime index for that. Uh, but I, I will look up the, uh, the, the discussion on the community forum uh, where this is uh, discussed, but yeah. Um, talking about the community forum, uh, that is before yesterday we said there is this crazy issue in the summary view. Before you write a ticket, go to the community forum and say, hey, I, re I realized this is happening in this, is this intended behavior or should I write a ticket? Something like that would probably be useful because um, yeah, then people would say, hey, I already did this. There's a ticket that has, just has a weird naming because it's super technical or it is already fixed in the version that is not released yet. Uh, that 
could very very well happen uh, that if we would have created a ticket yesterday, maybe someone did, I don't know, uh, for the summary view issue, uh, then uh, Victor would go, hey, Philip, this is so old news. It's, it's already fixed uh, like a long time ago. Uh, yes. So any other questions? Not yet. Uh, so Katya, I suggest we um, all get me a beer and you'll get a glass of wine and we'll do a, sh uh, a four minute or five minute break to get something to drink. Um, and then we uh, do a short sneak preview going through a couple of the chapters and picking out things that we think should be are interesting and that you should certainly read at home. And then uh, we do a question and answer session. And please, it would be super awkward if you wouldn't have any uh, question for us. And we sit there for 20 minutes uh, staring uh, at the screen silently. Uh, so I don't know, ask questions like, how can we migrate from there to there? Or uh, my client has uh, such a such a requirement. Uh, how do I do that uh, without reinventing the wheel stuff like that so if that's fine with you uh we'll talk to you in five minutes uh yeah four to five minutes i'll get a beer you get whatever you like and um we will not uh publish the uh, the q a session on youtube so feel free to switch on your video then um, the uh, the sneak preview will probably keep in the video for for YouTube, which could be useful. Okay. So a sneak pre preview of what you missed. Philip, there's a question. Excellent. Yeah, let's discuss that uh, after, the, uh, after the previews. Uh, it's a good question, Sylvie. Excellent. So yeah, we did this. In the next chapter, um, we would... Uh, write a, a new schema uh, to store data. But in this case, not to store data on a content type, but in the registry. Plone has this tool, the registry, uh, portal underscore registry, obviously it's called, that is a, a storage for all kinds of settings that are used in Plone and can be used for uh, to store settings uh, that you create yourself. For example, a, a custom, um, what's the easiest example here? Talk submission open. So there's the schema, it's called, it's inherited from an interface and it stores if talk submission is open. So you configure, uh, you can go to your, uh, your Plum Conference site and you have a, a control panel where you say, um, so here is the uh, here are the control panels, and there is a lot of stuff that you can configure. Oh, here are settings that you can check, and there will be a new form with a new field that say uh, talk submission is open because once the conference uh, stops or uh, starts, you can't submit any more talks. Or I don't know, uh, two months before the conference, you you not allowing to. Uh, uh, talk submission, but instead of going to the folder where the talk submission is enabled and changing the workflow or the permissions there, you just uh, in the code that does the whole talk submission thingy, there should be a, um, a check if this setting is true or false. And if it's false, uh, you can't submit talks. And if it's true, you can submit talks. That is a very nice way to switch that on and off again. 
that is what we're doing in this chapter. And we're dealing, discussing the whole registry thing because there are settings in Plone, for example, the web host, the, uh, which types are displayed in the navigation and in the search. And uh, on, in all, uh, all kinds of things are there. Uh, there is a user, user interface for that. And in this uh, a bit complex example, we are uh, storing uh, the types of talk that are in the schema at the moment as hard-coded strings in the back end. Hang on, it is in content talk. Uh, type of talk, it says talk, training, and keynote. But uh, I don't know, during the conference, when it approaches, you realize, ah, God, we need lightning talks as well. And we actually want the option to have them uh, submitted. So we could just add that here as lightning talks and so on. But then we would have to uh, redeploy the code, restart the site. Um, and make sure that all works. So what we want to do and what we're doing in this chapter to make the values that are available in this field configurable uh, for the administrator in the back end. So here are types of talks, audiences, beginner, professional, um, and uh, advanced. Uh, maybe you have a different kind of conference next year and these very broad uh, and also weird uh, categories do not apply. So you want to change them or you want to change the wording because beginner maybe uh, that is, if, if, you, if you ever consider dipping your toe into clone development, you're already uh, way beyond beginner being a beginner, I'd say, um, especially if you're in, in, in doing this training and so on. Uh, so this, these fields are JSON fields, and we're, from these fields, we create vocabularies that then can be uh, used in the schema that looks like, da -da -da, where, would you have, where do we have that? Uh, this is the control panel. Um, this is the user interface in the control panel. And then in the schema, these are the vocabularies. It's a a lot of boilerplate because it also deals with internationalization. In the schema, we just do this here. Vocabulary is PlonConf types of talk, bam. Uh, and you can reuse this pattern and reuse it and reuse it and re reuse it over again for your own data. That's what this pattern is intended to. It's not, uh, I'm not, I don't have types of talk. I, I have a multiple choice field. It's probably completely different. It is not. Reuse this pattern in your own code. We do that all the time. We don't use the uh, JSON field, but something else, but never mind. That is fine. The JSON field is, it, you just have to type JSON if you use Plone Classic. The huge benefit of that, you get a really nice widget that uh, Katya uh, configured here uh, that uh, way you can edit that in Volto as a user interface. So that's really nice. Um, yeah, that is this chapter that deals with this whole thingy. Uh, it's pretty long and it's pretty cool. And then you uh, add a new field room and also you have obviously the conference next year has different rooms. Can't reuse that. Um, upgrade steps. Oh my God. Yeah, that is a complex chapter where we add more catalog indexes and discuss querying catalogs, the catalog uh, more in depth in uh, Python, not in React using the search endpoint, um, because we want to write an upgrade step that takes our conference from version 0 0.1 to 0 0.2. Uh, because we're changing not only settings like we did like uh, so far, but we actually want to change data. So in this, in an upgrade step, you want to go and say, okay, uh, take all uh, talks and set the start date uh, to whatever. We, you had to move the conference by a week because a hurricane ruined the conference location. So you had to move that. Uh, write an upgrade step that changes the date uh, for uh, each talk, keep the order the same, but change the date by seven days and move it into the future or stuff like that. Or uh, that's what this code does, move 
cre create content on installing this package. So there is a uh, an upgrades. There's a upgrade step that runs between uh, versions that makes sure that oh we forgot to create some default structure and we want to uh, have all of that in place because i don't know the 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 server burned down and we need to to do stuff so um here we actually and this this upgrade step we find all talks because we were uh too stupid to create a, a deep sane a content structure, folder structure, and talks now live all over the place. Like Paul created his talk there and I created my talk there. And it's like, it's a super mess. And here we're finding all the talks and moving them. Please put them all into the schedule folder. Clean up, go, go through that with Python and clean it all up. And yeah, we, so everything here uh, it, that discusses stuff that you can use for these uh, kinds of uh, approaches. This is actually, this is only for Plone Classic, uh, where you have, yeah, here we, um, more query strings, so you can have uh, criteria uh, in collection uh, for rooms and speakers and type of talk, so you can have a listing block that only shows uh, keynotes, for example, and so on and so forth. Uh, we enable versioning, which actually is already enabled by default uh, in this content type, and so forth. There is a chapter on testing that uh, Katya created a new chapter on testing Plone Volto. That is exciting. You want to say something about that? Uh, just a few words. Uh, it's not a complete instruction how to write tests, but I thought it's important to know uh, which kinds of tests are possible in Volto. Um, there's EES and Cypress. Yes, will do, um, I, you write a test, it create, when you run the test, it creates a snapshot. And you, when you modify your code, you will see that the snapshot of the rendering of the component will change. And then you can, um, uh, investigate if this is uh, a change that you expected or if uh, um, the rendering change and you have to uh, work on your component. And the other thing that is really interesting, maybe you know robot tests. We have something similar, but it works quite well. And it's, yeah, it's amazing. Cyprus, uh, you, you write your tests to um, test the, the user interactions with your website. You can say uh, when the user clicks here, then uh, does this and fills this input field, and then he clicks uh, this button, then this should happen. And when you run the test, you will see the, the process, uh, the, your websites go through and it's, yeah. That's... Try it where um, uh, you don't have to write uh, a test, just run the test and you see how, how it could help you with, you with your work on the next project. So this is a pointer to where to start with testing. I'm a huge fan of tests and it's super important. There is a whole training on tests, not for Volto, but for uh, Plone Classic. Uh, written uh, two years ago, so it's pretty uh, current. Um, but, 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 but testing should be. Yeah. I can't find it. I must too. Uh, above Plone Six Classic UI theming. Oh, here. Yep. Yeah. Testing Plone. Uh, it's an excellent introduction to how to test test a dexterity content type to, to have it do what you want. Uh, there is a chapter on acceptance testing. That is, uh, these are the robot tests here. Uh, this is how they look in, in classic uh, clone when you test a browser. I um, really like this, the, the other syntax that you just showed. So let's go back there. Um, this is just a sneak preview uh, to testing. There is, uh, we can do, multi-day trainings on testing front end and back end.
mm -hmm. each multi days. Yeah. Um, next chapter, um, I, I, I reiterate that over and over again, there is, it is stupid to reinvent the wheel unless you really need to. There is so much functionality out there that you can reuse. For example, uh, behaviors like the event behavior, but there is also third party behaviors in the Plone ecosystem. And the same, uh, this is an example where for Plone Classic, where you use a banner thingy that we actually, we use that in a lot of projects lately uh, here. So this is a banner with sliders. I'm not a fan of sliders, but still, uh, and that has these nice banners in, in the pages. Um, this is Plon Classic, obviously, but the same true, uh, is the same thing that we want to drive home here is true for JavaScript. There is a huge ecosystem that you just need to use, and you can pick an, a, 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 or React components or JavaScript libraries, NPM packages okay. that you can use and to do what you want. If, uh, if you realize that you're writing a lot of code, uh, check yourself if that is actually necessary or if, you, if you're redoing the work that someone else already did, unless you're the person who loves to write their own frameworks. That is fine if you, there is like trainings, how to write a compiler and stuff like that. I'm, I'm certainly not the person to do, to do that, who wants to do that. I'd lo I love to reuse stuff that other people already um, created. And I like to create things that are missing and I don't think we need, I don't know, another banner behavior, for example, because then we have 15 competing standards here. Um, in the next chapter that is exciting, there is a, an, another content type that we're creating. It has a bit uh, more advanced fields. So we again use values from a vocabulary similar to the one uh, that we discussed is stored in the registry. And also this nifty trick here where we uh, protect data that is in fields. So you can in dexterity can uh, or in Plone, you can assign read and write permission to the data in the fields and the default views and the edit forms and the add forms make sure that uh, these are respected. And uh, so if you, if, if you look at something, you don't get the information that this sponsor is actually not paying any money, but instead is giving you a, a mountain of t-shirts and they get a gold, uh, gold sponsorship uh, badge for that. Uh, or uh, another note would be, hey, they, they haven't paid their bill yet. Ping them. Um, so this is uh, the uh, sponsor content type. Uh, we don't need a view for that. Instead, we need a, we want to display a sponsor component because like in the PlonConf uh, website, you see uh, sponsors are always there, no matter where you go. Uh, go to the sketch. Oh, actually they're not. Why are they not? They should. Well, it's this is this is not using this our training. It's a different code, but uh, the sponsors uh, here they are again. So this is obviously a component that is reused on the front page, uh, but not on every page. Uh, in our example in the training, the sponsor component is used everywhere, and it is like same as in the website. It's ordered by uh, level of sponsorship and stuff like that, and so it's a component. That is then like in classic plone a viewlet uh, displayed in uh, conditionally uh, or in every case. So that happens by customizing the footer here. That is a uh, that is a, a certainly an interesting chapter where you learn um, a lot uh, a lot more about Volto. Okay, Katya, do you want to say something about the Volto add-ons chapter? If there's um, anything interesting, it is. Yeah, it's <clears throat> it's uh, talking about how to use uh, existing uh, Volto add-ons, but it's really difficult to speak about because they are um, from from week to week there are new add-ons. It's a fast-growing ecosystem, and Philip opened the overview page, awesome Volto add-ons. 
where you can find uh, most of the add-ons and um, even the existing ones are changing because <clears throat> uh, yeah, they are refactored, they are brought together, merged together and um, this is just a pointer how you can use an existing add-on uh, when you start with your own project and uh, the next chapters would talk about how to write um, an add-on on your own if you need uh, a custom blog, if you want to um, write on a bunch of uh, own components, uh, view components, whatever, how you write the add-on so that you can use this add-on not only in one project, but we made our customizations today and yesterday, uh, but you want to use these changes or um, enhancements of a Volto front end in uh, multiple uh, projects. So you will write an add-on. Um, and what do we have using? Yeah, there's a chapter also about uh, how to enhance the default editor, rich text editor settings, yes, this chapter. Um, um, but before you start with this uh, chapter, um, just one note, um, uh, the default editor in world now is uh, Slate.js. Um, ah, Slate. yes. And um, we will switch in midterms or short terms, I think, to another editor called Slate. And it's uh, really awesome. It's um, the Draft.js is a good editor and uh, you can even customize it as you see this in this chapter. But Slate is um, storing the, the data of the blocks. Uh, an editor in Volto is every time our editor of blocks data. It, it has to be, it has to store the, um, the block configuration and the block data in, in, in a form and Slate uh, has another form to store this data than Draft.js. So Slate is not only more comfortable for the editor, but um, due to the fact that it uses a, um, another or better form to store block data and configuration, it's easier to customize and easier to, to write add-ons that, um, yeah, maybe I go too far. Uh, so there, there is a talk about the Slate editor uh, <laughs> during the conference. Yeah. Watch, watch the talk and well, you'll I, learn about that. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that uh, we will have another, um, another uh, a different editor. Uh, it's yeah. a major change. Hmm? Major change, yeah. Yeah, um, major improvement, certainly. Okay. So in the next chapter, we're actually writing a custom block. That's also Katya's chapter. There is uh, that's like a accordion thingy, isn't that? Yep, a simple accordion block. Yep. Um, as as an add-on. Yeah. It will be turned into an add-on in the next chapter. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is a way to write a known block. Uh, just a short note before you write a new block. Uh, we've seen the possibility to write uh, variations of an existing block. Um, so before you write in an own block, please think if you could uh, achieve what you try to implement uh, with a variation, because if an editor um, uh, creates a block or has created a block, and can, can he can change the variation afterwards. But a, um, for the moment, maybe um, this will be a future, a feature in the future, <laughs> then uh, we can, uh, the editor can also change uh, from one block type to another. But for the moment, it's only yeah, possible to change possible. The variations. So we have the situation that we can um, implement um, 
uh, lots of blocks, but we uh, have also this variation that comes most of the time very handy. In the next chapter, uh, that same block is uh, turned into a NPM package that can be added to your uh, Volto uh, installation. And uh, what do we have here? FAQ block that's then using that add on. Um, let's go a bit faster. So in the next chapter, we are allowing self-registration and submitting of content. Uh, so that is uh, the, the permission to create content. Uh, cr this is again configurable through the web, but we're storing this data, for example, here in sale, enable self-registration, uh, put that in the package. And once it's installed, self-registration is allowed. Uh, local roles are applied to a certain folder so that an, uh, users that are, an, I can't remember, it's all in there, uh, read it. Uh, the next chapter is uh, crazy. It uh, deals with relations. There is a, I think on Tuesday, I give a talk on relations uh, because you, there is uh, not only you can't only store text in fields, but you can also store basically links to other content types. There's its own catalog. It's a huge stack and you can create pretty complex uh, data structures with relations where you where a structure like a folder with two contents uh, is not uh, the only solution because an item can only be in one folder at a time. So if you want to display a hierarchy, a relation is most often the, uh, the right way. And this is um, mostly a documentation chapter. It's not like, okay, we're solving a task in the conference website. It, I should probably rewrite it to work like that, but it is uh, just a, con a, regist a collection of best practices of working with relations. Um, okay, let this, so we can skip that. There is a a uh, crazy chapter um, on voting. So there is a behavior that is reusable in a, uh, that is created in its own package. It's called Stasel Votable, I think. And it has, uh, gives uh, content, the feature to be voted on. So like thumbs up, thumbs down, similar to that, plus one, minus one. Uh, or neutral, and uh, the intent is here for the um, to to discuss data storage, uh, alternative data storage in this case annotations, um, and uh, as having permissions for that, querying this data, and uh, using this behavior. Uh, this 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 is basically you write uh, your own storage layer and logic to deal with this data. So this is real Python development. You, you're modeling a, uh, a, a feature that is, doesn't exist yet. Uh, and how to probably, uh, most not probably, how, how to uh, best do that and have a sane API and sane reusability. Um, and then to make uh, quasi matters worse, uh, we expose this feature in custom REST API endpoints because the REST API doesn't know about the feature that it can vote on, a on, on content for talks to have them included in the conference. Um, so we need to write a custom endpoint and that happens in this chapter. So endpoints are registered in ZCML again and are basically uh, code wrap, wrapper code around the um, uh, API methods that you uh, created for the behavior. And then we are using uh, this endpoint in Volto to allow voting on content types. So this is a whole round trip of the uh, complete, uh, the story of uh, ex extensibility and pluggability. How to, you write your own add-on, you add that as a dependency to the PlonConf side package. In, in your build out or in the setup py, then uh, you, you write a behavior, you 
plug that in into your content type. Then you write a endpoint, you plug that in into the REST API. Then you write a component and you plug that in into your view component uh, for the for talks and so on and so forth. So that is um, that is just mind blowingly cool, I think. Um, and it that's like if you if you do something like that, that is pretty advanced. That's pretty good. Um, and yeah, then we're using this package. Oh God, to make things worse, we're using this package that we just created, and we're not using it out of the box, but we're modifying it because the default settings in this be in this add-on are not what we want in our uh, in our conference because for us only uh, the reviewers are allowed to vote on content, not everyone. So we cover uh, we. And we don't patch again. We never patch unless we we can't help it. Then we patch. Uh, we um, plug into Plone and add a custom uh, or, or custom permissions uh, and manage them in our custom workflow. To, for example, uh, in, in 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 the published state, uh, voting is no longer uh, allowed. For example, this is uh, one of the use cases and so on and so forth i think we should stop there because otherwise we don't have enough time for q and a uh there is a, a chapter actually on a, writing a small uh super small application not using um uh, plone uh volto but using what does it use i can't remember what it use uh it uses a a view it's a view app Exactly, it's a Vue.js app uh, to um, to display the talk list and then to submit lightning talks while the conference is running. So you sit in the audience, you got your phone out, you have this minimum view app that uses the REST API of Plone to submit a lightning talk, which then end up, ends up in the database as a talk content type because the lightning talks are a new type of talk that can be added to the uh, to the to the type of talk. So and that's all in there and more. Okay, let's stop there. Um, I guess you realize that it takes a week to go through the whole training, including exercises to actually um, learn about most of the things and not just have it get, go in one ear and out the other. Um, I hope uh, at some point we, we were able to do a full week training, uh, hire us to do that. Um, and Katya, do you want to say something about, we should say uh, at least a few words about the Plone community, um, or we go into questions first and just inject these, uh, these points whenever possible. I'd say if you, if you want, you can switch on your video now. We will, uh, this training is officially over uh, concerning YouTube. And if you want, you can uh, show your faces uh, so we can uh, answer more directly. Um, but there is, uh, the, let's, let's pick the first question that Silvio uh, posted. Uh, he said, I'm new to Plone. Is there a way to migrate data from WordPress 